Welcome to the Coffee with Creators podcast, a casual conversation with creators about life and experiences. I'm your friend and your host, Michael. Today I'm talking to Adam Palavik. Like most creators, he wears many hats when it comes to work. He's a VFX artist, an editor, a film reviewer, and a YouTuber. He hosts a channel called Heroes Reforged on YouTube, along with two other friends. Adam and I actually met through work a few years ago, so we talked a lot about the pains and joys of working in the visual effects industry, the future of the movie-going experience, and why the age of social media has partly ruined the magic of cinema for both him and I. It's crazy how many hard drives, how much hard drive space we consume in just like a... This type oh of, um, <laughs> like, the sizes before, like, 10, 10 gigabytes, that feels like it should belong in a movie. You know what I mean? Like I know. an actual movie. Now it's just YouTube production, and just it's just crazy how... Yeah, like like yeah. a 500 gigabyte drive, you felt like you were rich in space. <laughs> yes. And a one terabyte drive, like, we record our podcast on the Blackmagic um, studio camera, the new one, the 4K one. It's literally 500 gigabytes per recording. Holy smokes. <laughs> yeah. Cause it's around, it's around like 80 to 90 minutes of recording. Mm-hmm. It's a 500 gigabyte file. Oh, so wow. I'm uh, like, I'd be out of a drive after two recordings. So like you, you have at that point, you like have to have the network attached storage. You do. You actually, but my do. plan is once we get through like a year of recording, I want to go back and I want to compress all the files from black magic raw to h265 so i still have like good quality but the file size hopefully is like cut by much, much smaller half yeah so yeah it's it's like uh, yeah and that's the thing is the cameras get better and more advanced i mean even this f uh this xt3 that i have i think it records up to 200 megabits per second so if i'm like i mean this is obviously going through the internet but if i have to record something and i'm doing 10 15 you know different recordings and different files it's going to add up really fast really fast yep Yep. Yeah. That's very true. Well, Being a content great. creator is great. You use up <laughs> so many resources. It's nasty. It's, it should it's, be illegal. It, yeah. It, it is funny because like you buy all the stuff yourself. And then some yeah. people have the audacity of asking for you to create something for them for free. And like, wait, oh, wait, 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 all, wait the time. all the time. All the time. All the time. All the time. People always ask us like, why aren't you making a video about this thing? I'm like, you do understand that that takes time to record, time to plan, time to edit. Like, you know, it takes a lot of time to put these videos together. And then you just put it out there on YouTube and people are like, I don't like your opinion. I'm like, well, then don't watch it. I don't know what to tell you. Oh, my God, Adam. We could go on that topic alone for <laughs> for two hours. I know. I know. I know. This it's like amazing, I enjoy yeah. doing it. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. You know, we've been doing it now for 2014. So this will be the eighth year. And it's fun. Like, I really like doing it. I like talking about movies, and I like spending time with Hector and Augustine to talk about that stuff. But sometimes, and it's usually not die hard like, fans that are like that. Because they get it. They've been around. Mm-hmm. They've seen all the videos. They understand the process. You can, they've been with you long enough that after you explain it to them a few times, like, I get it. I get it. It's always usually the random people who just pop in from video to video that are like came here for this and you didn't make that video and i'm like <laughs> we literally uploaded six things this week Seriously. leave me alone <laughs> I know. it's like they make you feel like you work for them yeah right totally yeah. it's very totally very annoying so i know let's let's rewind back a little bit Adam. Yeah. so um for those of you who are listening to this podcast welcome um adam and i have been have known each other for a couple of years now we work we worked in the past uh yeah for a production company, VFX company. Mm-hmm. This this was actually been a while. This was eleven years ago. <laughs> was it? Was it eleven years ago? Damn, I feel so old all of a sudden. I I I honestly don't understand how the last twelve years ran away so fast. I don't know. That I was twenty three when I worked at Legend. Yeah, and I wasn't even and, married then. Yeah. Oh my and god! And I'm gonna be thirty five this year. <laughs> Holy smokes. And, and then, I don't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, I, I have to say, though, I, I, out of my entire career, working at Legend was probably the most fun I've worked mm-hmm. at for a company. 
not for myself, but just for a company in general, because yeah. I was there for, I think, two years or less. No, I think it mm. was two years before they started <laughs> laying off people because that was the nature of the business, right? Yeah. That 3D yeah. was a big thing. And we would always like, I remember this. Okay. So the workplace was kind of like how I imagined it would be like to work in a fun company where mm-hmm. you walk in, you can bring your bike. I, I know Augie used to bring his yeah. bike, right? Yeah, yeah, he used to bring, always, yeah. He used to bring his bike upstairs and um, you can wear whatever you want. You can essentially come in at, what, at whatever time that you want. Not mm-hmm. necessarily, but they weren't too It was strict. flexible. It was very flexible, especially during that time. Like that wasn't, that yeah. was unheard of. And yeah. we had an arcade machine, a couple of them actually, in the break room. Did we? we oh, did. yeah. And yeah. then there was like a, wasn't there like a foosball table or there something? There was a foosball table. They would always bring us food. Like, yeah, I think honestly, just getting paid in free food was awesome. <laughs> was, I mean, when you're there for ten hours, twelve hours a day, you'd hope that that would be an option. But you know what's crazy though? It never felt, at least for me, it never felt like yeah, it was ten or twelve hours of working. That's true. I think it had its moments when we were like doing crunch, when we were in crunch on stuff like Green Hornet, Transformers, the Smurfs, Smurfs. Yeah, there was like more crunch, and then at one point, I moved from um stereo conversion to stereo compositing yes and that that was a little more involved especially for something like top gun because top gun we did the restoration on top of the conversion and i remember they were so picky just the grain on the film because we had to clean up the grain so we could clean up the actual film Mm -hmm. and then we had to put the grain back in and they were like if it doesn't match the original blue channel grain then we don't (laughs) want it and i'm like I'm literally <laughs> cherry picking the, like this is like this is ridiculous, <laughs> but it, it got it got crazy. I remember it got it got pretty crazy. And for a lot of those movies, we didn't have assets for stuff. Yeah, like for Smurfs, I remember they gave us assets for for that stuff. Yeah, but for Top Gun, like nothing existed. For the Shrek movies, nothing existed. We had to like generate our own um, our own alpha mats, like all kinds of stuff. This but it was still fun. Like it was a. It was a really good learning experience, yeah. and it got to meet really cool people. I'm still friends with so many of those people, yeah. And it like led to me being here in Los Angeles, which I never thought was going to happen. Honestly, whether it was because they were like laying people off or people were just leaving, like you know that is what it is. Um, but it was like a really good first experience to go to work, and to like you were saying. You kind of had the flexibility to like wear whatever you want. You could kind of stroll in almost at any time as long as it was within reason. You know, as long as you like completed the work that you needed to do, everyone kind of mostly left you alone. Yeah. And I, kinda nice. I think that was like the valuable lesson for me is that for me personally, so I noticed that the less you micromanage someone, the yeah. more the more you give them that that sense of pride with what they do, they kind of yeah. take care of it themselves. Right, right. Because we didn't want to lose that job. We didn't want. We wanted to to be better in every way, like more efficient. We wanted to optimize the way we work, and it's just it's just that sense of pride. Like remember, Mm. like the biggest thing for us was getting some sort of recognition on the big screen at the very end of the credits. As long as you see your name there, it's like, oh yeah, all those fourteen hour days were fine as long as I see my name there. So it that that sense of pride that they. They kind of instilled um, in us, just really helped me get through those days. And I I honestly really didn't mind it. But now that I'm thinking about it. Here's a fun fact for you. What's that? Of all the 28 or 30, it's like 28 to 32 movies. I don't have a single screen credit on any of them. I don't think I have one either. But that's crazy though, Adam. You've worked on way too many, like way more movies than I have. I think I've worked on three. Whether it was at Legend or at Stereo D, I never got a screen credit for anything. That's insane. Nothing. And I spent I spent like almost a year working on Captain America, The Winter Soldier, Mad Max Fury Road. I did stuff for like Godzilla. And then when we were at Legend, I did like Green Horn. Like I did a ton of stuff. I never got a screen credit for any of those movies. How did that make you feel? And I know. I, oh, I, have I was an so idea. happy to leave. <laughs> you're like, oh, no screen credits? Oh, you're going to Canada? Nah, I'm good. I'm out. I'm, <laughs> I'm leaving. It's it's like, because Legend was a little different. Legend was a little bit more lax because it yeah. was kind of disconnected from Hollywood. It was in San Diego. The executives kind of dealt with L.A. and we just dealt with the art. And in at Stereo D, it was 
similar ish, but it was also very different where, because we were in LA and we had clients coming in all the time to review all this stuff, you were kind of more integrated into like the whole process. Like there really wasn't any separation. Mm -hmm. So it was a little bit more cutthroat in that regard. And we worked, yeah, even crazier hours than a legend. You know, we were working six days a week, almost every single week for like a year and a half. Jeez. 10 hour days, 12 hour days. I worked a, I think I worked a 20 hour day once working on Ninja Turtles. Like I remember leaving the studio and the sun was literally coming up and I was like, am I supposed to, like, are you expecting me to be here in three hours? Like, how does this work? Um, so then by the time Star Wars, The Force Awakens came around was when they were like planning their exit to Canada. And I was like, unless you're paying me more, I'm not moving to Toronto. Yeah. Like, I'm not uprooting my life for that. So I, I walked out of there with a little bit of like a chip on my shoulder and a little upset that after, you know, up to that point, five years of working on so many movies, I never had a screen credit. Mm -hmm. And towards the end of that, you know, like the year prior, we had started, like Augustine and I started talking about like, let's do YouTube. Let's get Hector involved. Let's talk about the stuff that we really want to talk about. And it's weird because that ended up being in some ways more fulfilling than working on a Marvel movie. And it's literally, it's really just that recognition of having a screen credit. Because my family would go watch these movies and they're like, oh, what did you work on? And I'd have to sit there and I have to like point to shots. Yes. Because mm -hmm. there's no credit at the end yeah. for them to be like, oh, your work. Yeah. And it was just kind of like, eh. Yeah. Eh. Whereas, you know, you're making stuff on YouTube. You can see it. You you can see it like it's me it's like I'm one of the people on camera mm -hmm. I'm one of the people making all the you know editing everything so it's just completely different even though people don't necessarily look at it the same level as like a Marvel movie you end up putting like the same amount of work into that yeah and you're in charge of the whole thing from start to finish yeah we go back to the sense that sense of pride and of of you know just loving the work that you put out right like yeah. it's yours and exactly I actually remember <laughs> going to the movies with my family and we were watching Transformers I think and I, I, no I actually went with my my then fiance I said oh that shot remember that shot okay I remember working on it and she was like so bored because. <laughs> Because it's one of those things that you want to feel validated. You want totally. to. You want to know that. To you want people to appreciate your work, but in the grand scheme yeah. of things, it was kind of sad. Like we enjoyed mm -hmm. working at Legend. I enjoyed working at Legend, but yeah. At the end of the day, again, you have to point things out. Like I did that. I did that. And to them, they don't really care. You know. What yeah, I mean? and especially with three D, it's hard because, like, if you're a traditional visual effects artist, right? there's like so many layers to that. You're not, you're, usually you're not the one person taking a shot from concept to the screen. You know, you're either like helping design that shot, you're doing the previs on that shot, you're doing the rigging, you're doing the lighting, you're doing like the texture mapping, you're doing the actual modeling. So there's like so many things, but like if you tell someone, oh, I modeled Optimus Prime in this shot, you can at least understand you get a concept of what that looks like yes regardless of the fact that you know it has other people's work on top of that texture lighting all that stuff it's still the fact that you modeled that actual thing whereas with 3d it's kind of hard to like convey that and for them to appreciate that mm -hmm. because the whole thing is 3d and it like in a sense all looks the same like the depth might change from shot to shot but the audience isn't going to notice that. No. Yeah. Like they don't notice that the convergence points is shifting. Like they don't know. They like that's the thing about 3D is like it's you can't unless you sit there and you explain every single shot how different it is or like how complicated it is to put those things in 3D space, no one's going to know. Yeah. No, and I so, remember the first time I worked there, I could not tell apart like which why this one's more shallow than the other one. <clears throat> and I'm like, well, I don't make I don't understand it. And you kind of have to train yourself to see yeah. those depths. And yeah. then after that, watching, I could then uh, it's funny cuz like after working at Legend, I went to go see a couple of 3D movies that were converted by other companies. Mm -hmm. And I could tell that they were on a bit very thin budget because it's yeah. like, okay, that was terrible. <laughs> that that looked like uh cut out cut out boards, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, okay, that that was really bad. But for the general yeah. audience, they they probably wouldn't notice it. No, like there was there there are movies out there that like Blade Runner twenty forty nine. I mean, Transcendence was a big one at mm -hmm. at Stereo D. We did that, or we did, there was like a small team that worked on that, but it was very shallow and it was majority just like a cardboard cutout. There was no depth to it. Yeah. Whereas like with Marvel, they wanted us to build out 
everything. Yeah. But then at the end of the movie, they would have us compress all the depth. So we'd build something out and it had, it was like very 3D. And then by the end of the show, they're like, ah, oh, just compress the whole movie by 20%. And we're like, well, then why did we do all this work? <laughs> why did we put depth in the background? For, why did I separate the wall? To try to explain, yeah, to try to explain it to, to, to people who are listening. When we used to build, like there's ways of building that depth, right? Like you can mm-hmm. literally just like cut out the person and move them in the space, like forward right. or backwards. But what we did in the le- in Legend, like at least my experience, the ones that we really worked on, you had to literally cut out like pieces of the faces, like extend yeah. the nose out or, you know, move the ears like a back. a figure became like a, like a whole sequence of polygons, basically. It's insane. That you had to like shape insane into a face. Insane amount of work. And that, you know, and, that, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, and the thing that made that way harder at Legend was because we were using a proprietary software and those pieces wouldn't necessarily keyframe and stay in the same place all the time. <laughs> all the joys of working in production. I know, I know. And visual effects, like, I think now visual effects is getting more of the spotlight. That's good. Whether it, for in some reason, it's for, sometimes it's for good reasons, sometimes it's for bad reasons, which sucks because, like, no visual effects artist is trying to go out there and do bad visual effects. Mm-hmm. That's all dependent upon budget, time, the creative direction, who the director is, how good they are at, like, communicating what exactly they're looking for. You know, time is always the biggest thing, though. So, yeah. But I think now because it's getting a lot more recognition, even stuff that is a visual effect that, like, people don't notice as a visual effect, you know, that kind of slips under the radar. But the very obvious things, people are like, oh, you know, oh man, these visual effects in Eternals look really good. And I'm like, good. Those people should get praised because, like, sometimes you just feel like a cog in a wheel Yeah. when you're doing this stuff. I was, like, was going to say that, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's so much work that happens in the background that people don't even know, and the fact that you have to point it out so that people yeah. can say, "Oh, good job," is very yeah. annoying. It it doesn't feel you don't feel um, appreciated at all. Totally. Yeah, and, that and I think what, the most the most annoying thing is like when people are like, "Oh, this practical shot looks so good." I'm like, "Yeah, <laughs> you probably don't know that the background was replaced and it has like seven different buildings. The sky is completely different. Yeah. The cars on the street are not real." Like David Fincher is the perfect example of a director who uses so much visual effects, but because he's so meticulous with how it looks and he's very, very clear and concise with like what he wants, 90% of the time you don't know it's a visual effect. Like the Zodiac movie, so much of that movie is shot on green screen or like has set extensions and really? people don't notice it because it's so good. It's so good, yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. You, you know what, Adam? Um, I never got to ask you this, by the way. Mm-hmm. How did you get into the VFX industry? It's just because when I think about you, I'm like, oh, Adam, yeah, he, I saw him. I met him at Legend. And that's yeah. it. It's as if you were born. In that <laughs> I industry. was born outside. Yeah. How did you get in that I, space? Um, it's my fascination with visual effects started with Star Wars, which I feel like is such a like typical answer for any kid our age. Because, you know, those movies were like, you'd watch them like, wow, I want to learn how to do that. I want to learn how to make a ship fly in space. Yeah. So that was like my intro to it. And then I binged any like behind the scenes documentary making of featurette that I could find on Star Star Wars is where I started. And then I got into like Robert Rodriguez and Steven Spielberg and Jurassic Park, you know, like all that stuff. Yeah. And I just tried to find any material that I could find on how they did this stuff. And then I started experimenting on my own. You know, it's like I had a little little camcorder and I would go and I would like set up stuff and try to do it and all that. So I did that all through the end, or no, through majority of middle school into high school. I did all of that stuff. And then Legend put out a listing on Craigslist. <laughs> That's how I found them. Visual too. effects artists. <laughs> and I was like, this has to be phony baloney. That's what I thought too, yeah. There's no way that a visual effects company is in one in San Diego and two is looking for artists on Craigslist. On Craigslist. This has to be absolute complete bs but i responded (laughs) (laughs) i sent my resume and i had like it wasn't even a reel because i was just making stuff on my own so it was really just like a sequence of shots that i had applied visual effects to and it was like it was like um some of it was andrew kramer-esque okay some of it was like star wars related and but then i got a call and they're like 
hey, would you be interested in coming in and doing a test? And I'm like, okay, what's this job? Well, we can't really tell you too much, but we're working on like some Hollywood movies and converting them to 3D. And at that point, I had no clue. Like I had never, I don't think I had ever seen a 3D movie, Mm -hmm. like a full movie. I'd seen videos in 3D. You know, you like, you go to Disneyland and they have some like 3D experience. Right. But I had no concept of like what exactly they were doing. And then I went and I did that test. But because I had been studying so much like visual effects making of stuff, I had an idea and a concept for 3D modeling. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't know how to 3D model, but seeing that program, I'm like, okay. So I'm like looking around and it's in 3D space and I can move these objects and Z axis. So I like, I because of just watching documentaries on VFX, I understood the concept. And yeah, so I went, I did that test. I literally think five hours later, they were like, can you start on Monday? Like, <laughs> it's like three days from now. I have to give notice at my other job. Um, that so I was too, like, yeah. I like overlapped my jobs. I was working both. Oh, you did? You actually worked both for a little bit? Yeah, for like a month. I was doing both because oh, I didn't, like, I didn't know how long the job at Legend was going to last. Yeah. So I was like, I'm going to do both just in case. So I was working at AMC theaters at the same time. I was like a projectionist. So I would work at legend until five and some days, not all, but particularly on the weekends, I'd work at the movie theater. Mm. So like even Friday nights, sometimes like I would leave legend and go to the theater to work and I'd be there till like two in the morning. And then I would come back the next day and like open the projection booth at like nine. So I did that for like the first month or two. And after the second month, I was like, I don't think I need to be working both of these jobs anymore. (laughs) So I was like, sorry, AMC, I'm going to go do visual effects on these movies. (laughs) That's cool. That's cool though. Yeah. But yeah, so it was, it was mostly just like star Wars spraying the idea into my head that I visual effects would be cool. Mm -hmm. And then Craigslist was how I found that job, which whenever I tell people that story, they think I'm lying. (laughs) Like, I swear to God, because I know I'm not the only one. I know I'm not the only one. Yeah. Someone else saw that Craigslist listing and was like, I want to apply. Yeah. So after Legend, yeah. you were you worked at um, Stereo D for how long? Yeah, I was there from tw- well, I was there twice technically, because when all that stuff was happening at Legend, you know, I started hearing people were like, "Oh, people are leaving; they're going to Stereo D in L.A." And I was like, hmm, "How do I find out more info about this?" <laughs> yeah. And so I remember I I forget who I had asked. I had asked like I just asked around. And they're like, yeah, they're really busy. They have all these Marvel movies that they're working on. And I was like, I want to go work on a Marvel movie. Yeah. So I remember while we were working at Legend, I took like two days off or three days off. And I went to Burbank and I did the test at Stereo D. And I remember they called me. And this was in, I want to say this was like September or October 2011. Okay. So I was only at Legend for like a year and some change. And they got back to me and they said, hey, you did really, really well. Or, you know, the stereographer, the lead, lead stereographer was like really impressed. Would you be interested in starting on Monday again? I'm like, <laughs> I, Jesus, swear to God. Why do these places not let me give notice? Yeah. So I was like, well, can I give like two week notice? And they're like, well, if you have to wait two weeks, we may not bring you on on this round. We might wait till the next round. And I'm like, I want to get out. Mm. So I literally... On like Saturday, I tried calling people at Legend to let them know that I wasn't coming in on Monday. And I didn't reach anybody. Oh, you know, I, what happened was I was calling after hours. That's what happened. Uh-huh. Then finally, some somebody got back to me like on Thursday or Friday morning. And I was like, here's the situation. Da, 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 da. I'm not coming back on Monday. I'm not intentionally trying to burn a bridge. I just like got to do what's best for me. And I remember the supervisor at the time, I forget what his name was. He was like, well, you did just burn a bridge. I'm like, well, (laughs) sorry, man. Like you guys are only giving us, you know, 28 to 30 hours of work a week. What am I supposed to do? I can't like live off of that. Mm -hmm. So I packed up my car and I went to LA. Wow. Such a, such a crazy industry because we, we saw how, how fast it can, like the peaks and valleys are insane. It's like a roller coaster going really, really fast. Totally. You have, low days and you'll have extremely high days. Like I remember for yeah. weeks at a time, we would every Friday, they would call a meeting. And usually, mm-hmm. usually the meetings involved pizza and beer. That yeah. means we were doing really, really well, yeah. more work and more projects. But then there were months where like, there's nothing. 
And mm-hmm. that started to get scary. And that's when they started laying off, laying off people. And I remember, I think it was Disney who was shopping around for stereo, like 3D conver- con- conversion uh, companies, basically. Yeah. And they, they like Little Mermaid and all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. And then we found out later on that they were going to build their own production company. Right. So it's like, well, this is such a crazy industry. So it, it is, it does kind of suck that, you know, being in that situation, being in that industry, we all know how it worked. And for that mm-hmm. supervisor to say, oh, no, you're just burning, you just burned a bridge. And I'm like, wait, how, are you not in this industry? Do you not see how it works? It's insane. Yeah. But you're glad, though. How do you feel that li- leaving this whole thing? Like, I'm, I'm assuming you're, you're pretty happy with where you ended up. Yeah. I mean, I think I really enjoyed doing stereo conversion. I do think that it kind of like jaded my view and expectations of working in the visual effects industry because it's not it's not what you would call traditional visual effects right yeah because visual effects that like i grew up researching and understanding it's everything else that i describe you know it's like the modeling part of it and it's like really developing the thing from scratch with the filmmakers and the producers and the supervisors and all that stuff whereas for us it was just kind of like here's your shot this is how much depth it's supposed to have place everything where it's supposed to go like there really wasn't anything like you couldn't you couldn't really be super creative about it right like we experimented a little bit on some movies like i remember with abraham lincoln vampire hunter we would experiment where like the vampires had glowing eyes we would um they like painted in or i don't remember how they did it but they made the left eye and the right eye different like the eye would look like it was shimmering in 3d and that looked really cool but like we didn't get to do that on any other movie because marvel was like this is how the depth is supposed to be place everything where it's supposed to go which was cool but you know it was fun to like work on those movies yeah yeah uh especially with the team like i was lucky enough that i got paired up with a really cool team a couple times and we did mad max and we did captain america together and that was fun because our supervisor understood it was like a grind and he was like let's make this fun so he would always try to like liven it up, have us go do stuff together as a group, which was really cool. So like that made it, you know, bearable. Yeah, yeah. But then by the time, you know, I got to the end and like they were had to move to Canada and I was like, I'm good. I was pretty happy to leave. Yeah. Because I think like I was burned out by that. Yeah. At that you point, know, yeah. Just those long hours and like you would spend... 18 months people telling you we're in crunch we're in crunch i'm like dude this is like the crunch Every should day. not last two years <laughs> like this is crazy yeah yeah and you know like i barely took any days off i would go home like thankfully my family was in san diego so for me to go home for christmas it was easy i would just drive down there i'd be there in you know two hours and i'd spend like three days there and then come right back and go back to work and then we'd have new year you know so it was just like oh man I like I aged five years, but I haven't done anything. I haven't done anything. Like right. I haven't traveled anywhere. Yeah. I haven't seen anything. So at that point I was like, yeah, I think I'm done with visual effects for now. Time for a short break, but when we come back, we talk about the community Adam's built around his content and what the future of cinema might look like. So stick around. Working from home definitely has its perks. One of them being is that I don't have to sit in a lifeless, boring cubicle. I know for a fact that a little inspiration can really liven up my workday, so I've become intentional with the things I surround myself with. But inspiring doesn't have to only mean nice to look at, because they can be functional as well. So I'm urging you to check out Grovemade's beautiful collection of desk accessories. From their precision machined aluminum pens to their beautifully crafted laptop docks, you can find something that will organize your desk and inspire your work. I personally have a handful of their products in my office and I really love them. The design and craftsmanship make each piece feel special and that's because Grovemade wants you to build your dream workspace so you can get your best work done. Visit grovemade.com and save 10% on your first purchase by using the promo code MICHAEL10 at checkout. That's M-I-C-H-A-E-L-1-0 to save 10% on your first purchase. You and a couple of your friends decided to start a YouTube channel or a podcast. How did that go? So that all started because I, at the time I was obsessed with watching YouTube like movie talk shows. And they that was like a kind of a new thing. 
and AMC was the one that like really kind of spearheaded this whole thing because they had like a movie talk show and then I got like really deep into it and I started watching all these videos and they kept lumping in together like superheroes and horror and action and classics and I was like man it would actually be really cool if someone just focused on one thing just focused on superheroes Mm -hmm. and at the time you know Augustine and I would always go have lunch and that's all we talked about we were always like Oh, the Marvel movies, all oh, the DC movies, the Star Wars movies. And th- this happened while while we were still at Stereo D. Like we were in the middle of working on like, I don't know, 2014. We must have been working on like Captain America and like Guardians of the Galaxy. And I remember we kept talking, 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 talking. And I turned to him and I was like, what if we like made this a YouTube channel or like a YouTube show where we just like talked about w- exactly what we're doing right now at lunch mm-hmm. and we just put it on camera and we put it on YouTube. He was like, I think at first he was a little apprehensive, like, oh, do you think that would work? Like, how, you know, where would we shoot it? How that is it a podcast? Is it a video? Da da da. But the one thing he did say, he was like, if we do it, we have to get Hector involved. Because yeah. Hector is like a walking encyclopedia of comic book knowledge. <laughs> yeah. I was like, sure. At that point, I didn't know Hector. Like, we worked at Legend with him, mm-hmm. <clears throat> but because he was, I think he was like a, wasn't he like a production? supervisor yeah. or coordinator there yeah. i can't remember exactly I so he, I, I didn't really interact with him as an artist mm-hmm. so it wasn't until stereo d that we started talking more and i was like okay cool let's do it so while we were at stereo d which is kind of crazy like i can't believe that stereo d never said anything because we were working on the movies that we were talking about but we didn't talk about spoilers obviously right so whenever there was like a trailer for age of ultron and we did like a trailer reaction to that. We had to like avoid talking about so much stuff. Specific scenes. <laughs> yeah. Like we literally were in dailies or Augustine was in dailies when he saw Vision lift Mjolnir. Mm-hmm. And so like we had to avoid talking about all that stuff. And I'm sh- there. There's no way that nobody at Stereo D or at Marvel was like not aware of that. Right. And was not like paying attention to that. Right. Someone had to have been. There's no way. So we started doing that and it like kind of took off almost immediately. And I think the big thing that like really helped us was like, I noticed that people were like reacting to trailers, Mm -hmm. but the thing that they weren't doing was they weren't talking about them. They would like sit there, watch the trailer. Oh yeah. Oh my God. All right. Like, and subscribe. See you in the next video. And then it'd be gone. And I'm like, well, you're not going to talk about it. Like you're not going to talk about anything. So I told them, I was like, let's do it with Age of Ultron. Let's see how it goes, but let's like add commentary. And because we're so knowledgeable in like film production, comic books, let's bring that knowledge. Let's bring that, you know, information to people. So when they go watch the movie, they have maybe some context of like, who is Ultron from the comic books? How does he play into the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Mm -hmm. What could that mean for the future? Mm -hmm. And I think that was the thing that really helped kind of set us apart from other people. Right. Was people were like, oh, now I can come here for a reaction, but I'm also getting value out of it because I'm getting information. From exactly, people. it made you guys a lot more approachable because, like, yeah. for me, for example, I know nothing about the car- the the characters. I can watch trailer reactions all day yeah. and still walk away like with nothing, anything yeah. else, right? But if I were to visit your channel, I'd be like, oh, so that's how they tie in. You know, this is right. the relationship between these characters or whatever. And I think yeah. that just that approach where you guys talk about it, you add commentary. Mm-hmm. It's it's like one of those, um, when I was a kid, I remember I would watch a cartoon on a Friday night, and I couldn't wait for Monday so mm-hmm. I could talk to my friends about it. Right. Like, Did you guys see the last episode of the, the Ninja Turtles or Ghostbusters yeah. or something? It's that experience that you guys brought into the channel, which mm-hmm. I think is really a, a good idea. That's actually really awesome that you guys did that. Yeah, and I think it worked out because the feedback that we got from people was hey, I feel like I'm just in a bedroom or like in a room or, you know, in an office. And I feel like I'm just hanging out with my friends talking about stuff that I love. Right. So I think for a lot of people who maybe either had friends, but they didn't see them all the time or couldn't kind of find like their click, we kind of provided that conversational space for them because we would like talk about it. And then we'd ask the audience questions of like, what are the things that you want to know? And they would respond in the comments. And then the next video, we would like sometimes address those comments. like, Oh, this person asked about, you know, 
what comic books you should read about Ultron. So be like, here, check out these four comic books. You know, right. check out this. Yeah. Oh, check out the Civil War comic book if you're excited for Captain America Civil War. So I think like that made people feel like they had kind of like a home to go to mm -hmm. where they needed to get some like context or if they like, hey, I think this thing in this movie could mean this. And then we talk about like, yeah, now that the movie has Vision and Scarlet Witch, we could talk about like in the future, their romance or, you know, they yes. have kids and mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So <clears throat> I think that's what really helped us and kind of set us apart where other movie talk shows, because they were so involved and they were talking about like superhero stuff, action movies, horror, they kind of limited themselves with how much context they could give about one particular thing because they were doing everything. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what really helped us like grow. Yeah, and I was all, I was also pretty bullish about like the first year. I was like, by Comic Con we're hitting ten thousand subscribers, and I don't want to hear anything otherwise. <laughs> and they're like, dude, I don't know, man. That's a that's a pretty lofty goal to hit ten. Because now you think about it, and you're like, we hit when we opened our started our new channel, we hit ten thousand within three days. What? <laughs> yeah, within three days or two three days, we had ten thousand subscribers. But back then, like nobody knew us. Yeah. But we did it, and I was like, look, if we just like stick to this game plan and we're consistent and we yeah. put out videos every week and we like really grind it out, we'll hit 10,000 by Comic-Con. And I swear to God, ten like it was like around 10 a.m. or noon on Saturday of Comic-Con, we hit 10,000 subscribers. That is awesome. <laughs> and we were like, yes. It was, that is it awesome. It was awesome because it yeah. felt like so fulfilling. Yes. Because again, you work on all these VFX movies, like your name's not even in the credits. You have to like constantly explain to people what exactly you do they can't see it unless they're standing in front of a 3d monitor but with like youtube you see the results right there you see all the videos you see us in the thumbnail you see 10,000 subscribers so like for us it was a real confidence boost and we felt like okay what we're doing is working so mm -hmm. we, then we just kept at it you mentioned something that um kind of just made me think about this whole nerd culture okay let's just call it nerd, nerd culture right yeah. so growing up i mean being called a nerd wasn't really a a cool thing if they called uh -huh. you a nerd that was they were being mean to you totally right but now it's I'll, it's the coolest thing oh i will i will never forget there was a moment in high school i think it was in like ninth grade ninth grade possibly yeah because x-men 2 was coming out mm -hmm. and i remember in my i was like sitting in a classroom and like a classmate came by and was like oh hey man you're gonna go see the new x-men movie that's coming on theaters and i was like yeah i can't wait for it and I will never forget one of the, like another kid in my school who was kind of known to be a little bit of a bully. I remember he like walked by me and he gave me like the most like nasty, like side eye look of like, oh, you comic book nerd piece <laughs> of trash. And I'm like, yeah, look who's laughing now, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Look how things turned out, my friend. It's, it's, it's crazy how different it was just a few years ago. Like if you oh really God, look, yeah. right? Like we just really look at the, the grand scheme of things, like the, yeah. at a bigger picture. It wasn't too long ago when being a nerd was not the ideal thing. But yeah. now, like what you guys are doing, this is why this is why it reminded me of that when you said that you basically created you basically created a community where people can listen in and watch and feel like they belong mm -hmm. in that group of friends. Back then, that would be called like a group of a group of nerds. You know what yeah. I mean? It's, now it's just, you were like you were like sitting. If if anyone left you a table space in the lunchroom, you'd be lucky. Yes. Otherwise, yes. you were like sitting in the back corner of the room in the gym alone. Yeah exactly how it was it's just how it's just how it was but now yeah. it's so different and i'm enjoying this because now i can think of my kids growing yeah. up in a world without worrying about being called a nerd just because they like yeah. something now wearing a spider-man backpack to school is cool it's the coolest thing back then they would kick you kick your backpack <laughs> yeah i see grown grown people walking yeah. around in costumes yeah and i'm I like mean, that's cool the one like asterisk for me I was always like a really tall kid. So a lot of people didn't mess with me because of that. Like they always thought I was older. I see. So that was my like literally only thing that like saved my life growing <laughs> up was I was a tall kid. Like I was like, I was already like five, seven by the time I was in like fourth or fifth grade. Oh yeah, you were so a tall I, kid. So I was like tall, yeah. taller than like everyone in my class. And that, that kind of like stayed that way all the way till high school. So I was lucky in that regard. But there were definitely kids who were not my height, who were not six over six feet tall, who were picked on all the time. And they were no different than I was. They liked the same stuff. They were into the same things. It was literally like 
you were just an easier target because you were not over six feet tall. Right. Which right. sucks. Yeah, that it does sucks. suck. It sucks for me now because I'm still, I'm a grown ass man. I'm still not at five seven. <laughs> just say that. <laughs> but that's okay. We, Man, we, yeah, it's it's so like unfair when you think about it of like how people were treated just for liking something yes, that yeah. was like different from what other people like. And now everyone's like, oh man, I'm such a big fan of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I'm like, you mother <laughs> effer. I remember the things that you were into. You were like all about soccer. You were all about football, baseball. Right, you would right. like, if someone said comic book, you started to like dry heave. Right, exactly. And you know, for, for the younger listeners, it's an, completely true. Yeah. It was a different time. People just, it's almost like you never talked about comic books out in the open. You just selected a few of your friends. I mean, look at Comic Con. Yeah. Dude, I Comic-Con remember. Comic Con before 2005 was like barely any, not that enough. barely anybody went, but like. You can buy your enough. ticket at the door. Oh my God. Yes. 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 You can buy your ticket at the door because that was you my could literally first visit. Get in line. Yeah. They'd give you the paper, you'd fill it out, you'd give them 20 bucks. And, and they you give you a in. pass, and you walked around. Yeah, it was free to roam about that country. It was it was weird. Like my I my first experience was exactly like that. I literally yeah. just walked into the front door, bought a ticket there, and just went inside. Yeah. The second one, I actually just snuck in. <laughs> yeah, yes. no one gave a damn. I just snuck in. It was fine. No one cared. Yeah, no one cared. And then all of a sudden, now it's like it's not even Comic Con anymore. It feels like no, it's Pop Culture Con. It is Pop Culture Con. That's exactly what it is. Yeah, so much. But it's it's a part of me likes the fact that it grew so much. But there is a part of me that kind of misses the old, simple, oh, yeah. let's talk about comics. You know, let's not talk oh, about all for these sure. other things. Yeah. I mean, Artist Alley was like a whole fourth of Comic-Con. Yes. Now they're tucked away in the back corner. It's kind and of I'm sad. like, we've really skewed all of this. Yeah. Like, yeah. it's called Comic-Con. It should be a celebration of comics and the characters that came out of those comic books and the artists and the writers who made all those things. And now they're like tucked away in a corner because Hasbro has an enormous toy booth where people are in line to buy a 14 inch statue of Superman, which is cool, Mm -hmm. but it's kind of lost a little bit of like what it's all been about. Right. And you know, once they brought in Harry Potter and the Twilight movies, forget about (laughs) it. That those literally those two franchises changed comic Con. They, they absolutely 100 yeah. percent. yeah and i think now because of the popularity of like the mcu star wars and dc like some of that has kind of reverted back to the comic book stuff especially marvel like marvel never fails to give a good presentation so that's kind of nice like it's slowly kind of reverted back to the stuff that's like based on comic book characters mm-hmm. and less about you know like the real pop culture type of things. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I I still think it's going to continue to be the way it was. I don't know. I'm actually very curious to see how Comic-Con is going to be if they do one this year in the summer. I don't know. Maybe Mm -hmm. not. But once it's kind of like back to being on schedule every summer, I'm curious if it's like going to be super crazy again. You know, 200,000 people in in the Gaslamp District trying to see the latest trailer for Batman. Or if it's going to kind of like die down a little bit. Right. That will be interesting. What do you think is the future of comic book? Uh, super, I mean, comics, or not comic book. Uh, let me start again. What do you think is the future of um, superhero movies moving forward? Because I feel like we're almost at that point where most people are just getting tired of superhero movies. And mm-hmm. I can kind of see slightly, because I'm not so deep into it, but I can kind of see how Marvel is aware that their audience is also growing up. I mean, watching mm-hmm. The Eternals, they had some scenes there, the 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 the, the love scene, basically. Yeah. That no a one little was sexy expecting. time. Yeah, a little sexy time, and it's one of those things that if you brought your kid to watch the Marvel movie with you, yeah. you'd be like, oh, okay. I mean, Civil War was actually is probably my favorite Marvel movie, just mm-hmm. because it felt like the story was, it's it's such a a, a grown up story that you just mm-hmm. just happen to put superheroes in the mix, right? right? But do you feel like do you feel like Hollywood recognizes this or they just they just know they see the cash? You know what I mean? Like we're still gonna sell movies regardless. I'm a, I'm just afraid that creatively speaking, I feel like um or my creative side is 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 worried that it kind of just dilutes the whole uh genre in, in a way. It's like, okay, 
more superhero movies. Like we don't really care anymore. It's gonna sell. Yeah, and I think like there's an honest conversation to be had about not even just superhero movies, but like the whole industry period. Okay. And I think the pandemic has been a huge eye-opening thing for studios, for people, you know, consumers, everybody of like, I mean, okay, you look at Spider-Man No Way Home. That movie made like $700 million. And we were in the middle of like, we were in the middle of a variant surge of yeah. COVID. Yeah. That didn't stop people from going to see that movie. Mm -hmm. West Side Story did not do well. Basically anything else that wasn't Spider-Man did not do did not do that well. Unless it was like a low budget movie. Then like that's a completely different story. So I think like, yes. Is there a, are we, I don't want to say, is there a lot of saturation in the superhero genre? Yes. But it's the only thing that audiences are going to watch. So I understand why studios are taking advantage of that. Yeah. Because without superhero, like, let's be honest, without superhero movies, how big of an audience is going to really go out there to see West Side Story? Not a lot. Not a lot. Especially with the option of streaming now. Yeah. And I hate that personally. Like, I love watching movies in the theater. And I don't want to only, I don't want to get to a point where I can only watch Marvel, DC, Star Wars Star Trek, Jurassic Park movies, Fast and the Furious movies in the theater. Like, I want to watch everything. Yeah, yeah. I want to be able to see, you know, A24, like, Lamb or Pig or The Green Knight. Like, I want to go see those in a theater. I don't want to just, like, it's going to be available on uh, Netflix. I'm like, no, I don't want to watch it on Netflix. Mm -hmm. At the very least, give me a disc so I can watch it on a disc. I don't want to stream the movie. Right, yeah. Um. So, and there's been a lot of talk about that recently of is... Is the movie theater experience going to evolve and become almost like a concert where, oh man, you know, Captain America 4 is playing at the theater starting next week. Let's get our tickets. It's only going to be in theaters for like three weeks. You know, like if it's going to turn into that thing where it's it's all like the superhero genre or just like the very like, you know, those big like IP movies. Yeah that drive all the box office numbers like those are the concert events that's like your that's your coachella yeah. is when all these like marvel movies and star wars movies come out and that's what you're buying a ticket for like i don't want that to happen i i would love to be able to see everything but do you think that's the direction i think it's very possible and i think like with every major studio almost every major studio having a streaming service now like what's holding them back yeah. What's really holding them back? You know, they make a deal with theaters and they say like, I mean, the, the theatrical window gets shorter and shorter and shorter. You know, I think Universal was able to negotiate a 30 day window, theatrical window. It, it was like, I think it, when it started, I think it was like 90. Then it went down to 45. Now it's 30. I mean, I have discs for movies that just came out like a few months ago. Like I had Dune a month ago and it was just in theaters in October. That is insane. You know, like the turnaround for these movies now to go from theater to streaming to, to disc. digital, yeah. I remember when I bought Star Wars on VHS, The Phantom Menace, it came out a year after the movie yes. played in theaters. Yes. That you was, know, that's that just how I doesn't exist it anymore. Doesn't exist anymore. Do you think it also has to do with I mean, they probably have seen this a long time ago, but I'm just really curious at what made HBO uh, decide to do the the whole the same day theater and streaming mm -hmm. service thingy. And do you think other streaming services are going to follow suit? I think Warner Brothers was smart to do that, honestly, mm -hmm. because they're already charging more, right? So compared to Disney Plus, they're charging double. They're charging fifteen a month. So if you were to charge fifteen a month, plus make people pay another fifteen dollars to rent a movie. On top of that, I think people would be like, oh, I don't wanna I don't wanna double like I don't wanna pay twice. Yeah. Yeah. Give me one price. Mm -hmm. And I think despite like Disney's lucky that they're Disney because they have a built in audience, like they have a built in fan base that's like very loyal. Mm -hmm. And if you make the streaming service five dollars a month, yeah, it's I personally think it's way too expensive to charge someone thirty dollars to rent a movie on Disney Plus. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It stays in your account forever. Yeah. I get that. But that's a lot to ask sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm one person renting a movie for myself, 
or buying the movie on Disney Plus myself, that's a lot compared to a family of five who are going to watch it. Yeah. You know, but, but, but at the same time, I see how it's advantageous for families. Mm -hmm. Like you can go to the theater and, and spend, you know, 150, I don't know, like with popcorn and all the stuff that kids want and all the snacks, you're spending like over a hundred dollars to go to the movies with your whole family. Mm -hmm. I, for the rest of my life will remember what it was like seeing the dark Knight for the first time with an audience, captain America, civil war, seeing Spider-Man on screen for the first time. Yeah. Avengers Infinity War Infinity War and Endgame like unmatched like it's unmatched. unbelievable yeah. yeah you know and and when we saw Avengers Endgame for the first time we went to a press screening at Disney so we were with like other reviewers and critics and all that stuff who kind of could have just been like dead in the audience they could have just been very indifferent no when Captain America lifts Mjolnir for the first, like everyone was like screaming and well we were the loudest probably <laughs> But everybody was super excited. And, like, yeah. you can't replicate that at home. No, you if you're just watching yeah. it at home, especially if you don't have, like, a nice setup or you have, like, a very normal setup, yeah. you just have, like, a TV and a Blu-ray player, it just doesn't it doesn't capture that. The that magic feeling. is lost somewhere. Yeah. It's just lost And I somewhere. think that's why Spider-Man did so incredibly well because people loved going to see that with a crowd. And, mm -hmm. like, all those surprises that happened in that movie – because you spend months and months and months talking about it online and you're like, oh, I hope this happens. I hope this person shows up. I hope this character does this thing. Right. And then you watch it and you're, you're sitting there in an IMAX theater and you've got 500 people there with you. You forget that there's like a pandemic happening. You forget that there's like all these things happening and you're just like, I'm just here. I'm invested in this moment. Everyone is here with me for the exact same reason. And you're just like celebrating something. You, yes. That's a so very think, good way of dis describing it. You're yeah, celebrating so I, it with someone, yeah. Exactly, and I think that completely changes the experience of watching a movie in a theater versus watching it at home. Like, I love watching movies at home, mm -hmm. but I've seen all of them in the theater, or most of them, mm -hmm. you know, the ones that I can or could have seen in the theater, I've seen them all in the theater. So it's just like, it just really changes the experience, and I don't know. I remember back in the day when I used to work in VFX, and if there was any hint that anyone dropped a, a leak leaked footage or 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 whatever or a spoiler you would get fired like faster than you can th you know think about it yeah. but it's insane how there's so much leak leaks and just like spoilers floating ever floating everywhere how do you feel about yeah. that and why do you think that's happening do you think it's like they intentionally put those out to drum up some i don't know honestly and I could be way wrong about this. Yeah. <clears throat> so I could be I could be totally wrong about this. I honestly think it's people who are just looking for clout. Okay. Like I think it's people who work either with this or not with this, but they work for the studios, whether it's a post-production studio, the you know, Sony or whatever company itself, and they feed this information to people who like tweet about it, and then people get really, really excited. They're like, oh my God, did you hear that? Blah, 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 might be in Spider-Man or this character might be in the Batman movie. And it makes them feel good because like, yeah, I'm the, I'm the one feeding, feeding people this information. It like gives people a high. Mm -hmm. I personally hate it. And I hate that Twitter accounts and websites and even like very reputable sources, you know, places like Variety and The Hollywood Reporter, like all these websites that usually I'm like, oh yeah, I only take, I only consider them like an official news source. Because now everyone who has a Twitter account who calls themselves like Marvel News <laughs> pretends like, you know, they're like an official source. I'm like, yeah, you got your information from somebody who like leaked it from the production office or yeah. from the set or whatever. And like we know how those movies can change and evolve and mold and all that stuff. Probably the most memorable movie experience for me, like theater experience, was watching Transformers, the first one mm -hmm. at the theater. Because at that time... This was early 2000s, and I grew up watching G1 Transformers, like first generation, yeah. big fan. And I had no idea what to expect walking into the theater, and that alone in itself. So you imagine you have no expect, you, you, have, you don't know what to expect, basically. Right. And then seeing your childhood heroes just showing up on the screen is such a very, very different experience, like yeah. hearing Optimus Prime for the first time. And I remember that was the first crowd. Actually, that was the best crowd I've ever been in, like a part of uh, in a movie theater because the moment Optimus Prime started talking, people started cheering. And I'm like, I've never been in this this type of uh, environment before. 
The yeah. entire movie was like that. And that would, it would, you know, and I went to go see Spider-Man. And because I tried to avoid all spoilers as much as possible, except for that one thing that I sent you on Twitter, because I just needed to to confirm, like, is this true? Because why is it out here in the in the internet space? Ay, ay, ay. Right? And when when I go when I went to go see Spider-Man, I was surprised with a couple of things, but still there was missing. There was something missing. Just because yeah. it, it's spoiled. You know, it, it's right. very unfortunate that we experience yeah. that now. I mean and a lot of this is because I just didn't follow the movie news, especially superhero news, that closely back then. But if I went into Iron Man knowing that Nick Fury was going to show up at the end credits and drop Avengers, I would have been kind of bummed. Yeah, yeah. Because that whole experience, and I, I didn't even like, I didn't necessarily grow up reading co Marvel comic books. So I like knew of the Avengers because they were on comic book covers next to the DC stuff that I read. But I didn't like know the characters. So when that happened at the end of Iron Man, I was like, oh, what is this? Like, I don't know what Ave yeah. well, Avengers, <laughs> what? And then, you know, the next year Comic-Con, you know, Kevin Feige came on. was like, we're building up to the Avengers and da -da -da, we're going to do Iron Man and blah, blah, blah. That was so cool to be a part of that experience as it grew. But now it's like I open Twitter and it's like breaking news. La 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 is gonna be in this movie. They're playing this character. I'm like, why can't you just let like yeah. why can't you just wait till the movie's out for me to know that? Yeah. But it's like they those clicks drive traffic. Those those that traffic drives, you know, revenue on ads and you know, all this stuff. And I'm just like, man, this does kind of like ruin the anticipation. It does. And a lot of times our audience will ask us. Hey, can you react to this clip from the movie? I'm like, no, mm -hmm. I'm not watching any clips. Mm -hmm. Like the trailers is all you're getting from me. Yeah, I don't want to see the 15 clips that are part of the you know the the electronic press kit. Like I don't want to watch those. The trailers I'm cool with because they're fun. They hype you up for the movie. But then like outside of that, radio silence. Like don't tweet anything at me. Don't DM me anything. Don't tell me anything. Like I don't want to know. Mm -hmm. I don't want to know that. The, I don't even want to know that there's a post credit scene in the Batman. I don't know if there is one. Yeah. If there is one, I don't want to know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to sit through the whole credits anyway. Yeah. Just let me live it. Just let me experience it. But I don't know. Yeah. There's like this really weird obsession now with everybody knowing everything about every single movie before the movie comes out. It's very and annoying. I'm like, what? What's the point? <laughs> yeah. Like, what what's is, the point? What is the point? So you can go to your like groups and be like, guys, I found out that the Green Goblin is going to be in No Way Home. I'm like, just let people experience the movie yeah. i'm gonna watch it so i think you are right then i think it's mostly about just like clout that's what it feels like to me yeah. because there's so many of those like instagram and twitter accounts that are just like always like there's one and i don't know why i get notifications from it on my twitter because i don't follow them and they don't follow me but because they're like in the category of stuff that i like always like there was literally one yesterday that was like or yesterday or the day before that was like breaking news. This uh, the character who plays Ned in Spider-Man movies isn't going to be in the new trilogy, and I'm like, who is telling you this? <laughs> or they're like, Sony has confirmed that Andrew Garfield's coming back for more Spider-Man movies. I'm like, no, yeah. where? Yeah. There's no press release about this. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and it just like they get thousands and thousands and thousands of retweets, and I'm like, this is all it's about. It's all about just getting retweets, getting followers. So you can try to like get your way in. I mean, for Eternals, there was a perfect example. And again, this goes back to like reputable sources like Variety and the Hollywood Reporter. The the I think it was Variety. They literally ran a cover story the night of the premiere of Eternals. Did you see Eternals? Uh, yes, I have. Yeah, literally on like the cover. Like the cover story was Harry Styles shows up as Eros oh at the end of Eternals, and I'm like. It's the premiere. No the movie's way. not even out in theaters. What are you doing? And people were pissed, but they never took it down. They like made an adjustment to their article and everybody was like, why would you spoil this on the premiere night? Like people can't see it for three more days. What? That is insane. Yeah. So it's gotten to that point and I'm just like, I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand this obsession, you mm -hmm. know, and it's, and it's not even just finding out like, story points or story plots about the movie anymore it's also like how the movies are made like everybody wants to know the drama of how a movie's made and i'm like 
Why? Yeah. Why do you care? Yeah. If the director and the actor argue on set about a scene because they can't like come to a come to an agreement about something, let them hash it out on set. If it's not hurting anybody else and it's not hurting each other physically or mentally, but they're just like hashing it out, that's what that's what making movies is. Yeah. It's that, all about it's compromise. Yeah, exactly. You know? It's weird because it kind of reminds me <clears throat> of how it felt working in the VFX industry for a little bit mm. because I didn't like the one thing I didn't like about it is because it completely ruined the movie experience for me as well. Right. Like remember, I remember watching on, I mean, working on a couple of Transformers clips, The Dark of the Moon, mm-hmm. and we we saw the clips before the VFX was in there. We saw right. the scenes. We knew what was going to happen, and so watching the movie was just not the you same know, anymore. Marvel, Marvel makes Marvel does movies, and they do a lot of their pickups on green screen, and then they comp things out. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it is because they're like reinserting stuff, or they've changed the dialogue, and they need to re. And people find that material and they're like, ugh, of course. Of course Marvel recorded this on the green screen. They can't even bother to build a set. And I'm like, you have absolutely no context to this clip. Yeah. Your context is that they're on a green screen. That's you it. don't know if it was like a pickup shot, a reshoot. The actors weren't available, so they had to put them put them on green screen and then comp them together. They couldn't afford to rebuild the set. They, the set's no longer available because they destroyed it or the location's not available. Like there's so many variables to making a yeah. movie and to just be like, ugh, here's Star Wars, here's Marvel, here's DC again, filming something on a blue screen. And I'm like- I'm gonna piggyback on this oh, yeah. topic right now, okay? So, and I'm gonna try to tie this in with what you do as a creator yeah. nowadays, because we kind of t- <clears throat> talked about this earlier. So what people don't understand about these these big movie productions is there's the, the, the economics of trying to make a movie happen yeah. Make it real, like actual happen. It's so complex, right? Like you have to pay oh all these people. You have to, there's time management. There's so many things, right? And the only thing that they can um, come up with is complain that it's being shot in a green screen. So this kind of reminds me of our conversation earlier about you creating content on your channel and mm-hmm. people just waltzing in and saying, how come we didn't talk about this? How can, you know, basically the haters, all yeah. right? <laughs> like, how do you deal with them? And what are your thoughts on this? It's a good question. Each of us deal, like out of the three of us, we all deal with it a little bit differently. I used to be very aggressive towards those people. And I would just kind of tell them like, if you don't like it, don't come back and watch another video because this is how it is. And this is how we do our stuff. Because I think a lot of people sometimes also would come into videos and they, they expect us to know as much as they do, but they spend all their time on like Reddit and forums, researching all these like spoilers and things. So we finally had to get to a point where we told people, we don't do that. We don't look for spoilers. We don't, you know, we don't sift through Reddit threads. Like we don't look for any of that stuff. And sometimes like, well, isn't it, isn't your job to like know everything about these movies? I'm like, no, my job is to bring the insight that I have from my experiences of working on movies and from my experiences of what comic books I've read and what that could mean in the context of the film. Mm -hmm. That's not, that's not, that's not, it's not my job to research what happens at the end of the movie to then tell you what happens at the end of the movie. That's like completely pointless. So I used to be a lot more aggressive towards those kinds of people. Now I'm kind of at the point where I'm just like very quick to respond and I just like, oh, we don't, we didn't like, we didn't watch all the trailers or we didn't like, we didn't watch any of the behind the scenes stuff or we're not like, we're trying to save stuff for the movie when we see it. Mm-hmm. So I'm like kind of quick to respond. And if people are just nasty, I don't even respond to them. I just block them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's a good technique. I, yeah. I just don't have the time or the patience for it. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to sit there and argue with someone in the middle of Nebraska who thinks that they know more about the industry than Disney. And I'm like, I'm not going to sit here and argue. It kind of goes back to validation, else. right? Like it, you yeah. don't want to give them that satisfaction that their comment was, is validated by your, mm. your response, right? Your exactly. anger or anything. So yeah, just delete or hide or block. Yeah. yeah that's, that's actually, or I do that thing where I'm like, they'll leave like a really, really long comment and they're just like critiquing every little thing that we say or that we like don't research enough. And I was like, all right, cool. Thanks, man. (laughs) I'll literally just say that. And it freaks them out because they're like, one, one, people sometimes are surprised that we respond to comments. And I'm like, where do you think this goes? Do you think this just goes into an ether that like disappears? Like, do you think these comments go into a black hole? (laughs) People read these comments. That's why comments are there. Yes. And they're like, well, first of all, I didn't even think you were going to respond. Second of all, I don't know how I feel about the way you come. I'm like, okay, man, thank you. I just, I don't, 
I don't care to give those people attention. Right. Like I'm yeah. way more interested in responding to someone who goes really in depth and they're like, oh, I love this discussion. Let me add on to it. And here's what I know from my experience of reading the comics or watching the movies. I'm like, great. I love this. Yes. This I love. Yes, exactly. If, if we're expanding the conversation into the comment section, that's that's what I love. That's what but it's But if it's someone about, being yeah. like, I don't like what you said. And I'm like, well, then don't watch. <laughs> Simple as that. I'm not you. Yeah. I don't share your life experiences. I don't share your, you know, like, the, I don't like the same movies that you do. And that's, that is like my biggest thing is always people are like, how do you like this movie more than this movie? I'm like, because I'm not you. Yes. Why is that so hard for you to understand? Mm -hmm. my, con my, my context of my experience of the movie, like I love Batman and Robin. That doesn't mean it's a good movie. I recognize that it's a bad movie, but it's so silly and ridiculous that I love watching it. Mm -hmm. But people are like, how do you like that more than Batman versus Superman? I'm like, well, first of all, they're two completely different movies. Like one is like, you can't compare those you, you two movies. You just can't compare those, yeah. No, yeah. they're totally different. Mm -hmm. And I and I enjoy and, and not enjoy those two movies for very different reasons. Yeah, it goes back so, to personal preference, right? Personal yeah, preference, and like yeah. some people just can't grasp that concept that like you don't like something that they do. I'm like, hey, man, that's life. I remember you, there are things that you like that other people don't like, and there are things that you know that people think you're nuts for liking. Yeah, but that's but that's like, okay. That's life, exactly. That's okay. You know, that, and I think people should be okay with that. Where do you see? Um, where do you see? Your, your YouTube channel going from this point on? That's a good question. We we always talk about that at the start of every year. <clears throat> we always try to think about like, what do we want our goals for the year to be? What do we want to do? How do we want to grow? You know, we, we so we, we do a lot of reaction content and we never, outside of movie trailers, we never did reactions to shows or movies ever. We never did it because we were like, we never wanted to commit to like a 23 episode season of a show. Because mm -hmm. back, the, you know, back when we started, that's all that was available. But now that all the streaming services offer, you know, seasons that some of the episodes are half an hour to 40 minutes and there's only six to nine episodes, we were, when, especially with Disney Plus, we were like, okay, let's give it a shot with Mandalorian season two. Mm -hmm. And we did it. It was nine, nine episodes, eight episodes. The response was great from the audience. We had a really fun time watching it together. Obviously, I think it really did help that we were in the middle of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think it would have worked otherwise. So it's like we always are trying to figure out what is the stuff that we can do on a weekly basis that just kind of keeps us on the radar with, yeah. like, studios and fans and all that stuff. But in the background, work on at least one thing that's a little bit of a high concept for us right. that we can plan on doing throughout the year. We also had, like, we really want to do movie screenings with fans. We've talked about that for years. And then when COVID happened, we're like, okay, well, we can't do that. But we still want to try to figure out how we can do something like that where we host screenings of our favorite movies and bring someone from the movie to talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, that's like something that, and especially because we have that visual effects experience and we have that 3D experience and we have like, because a lot of the times the people that host those things, they're a critic or mm -hmm. a reviewer, which mm -hmm. is totally fine. And they have, <clears throat> they're very insightful from like a filmmaking perspective, from like a story perspective. But I would love to talk about like the technical aspects of stuff. Mm -hmm. Like I love the way the Batman looks. No interviewer is going to ask Matt Reeves about the lens choices that they made. Like very few are going to ask, right. like why did you use anamorphic lenses? Why did you use these lenses? What, you know, but like that's the stuff that I want to get into mm -hmm. of like, how did you, you know, choose that lens versus that lens? How did that affect your lighting? How did that affect where you place things in 3D? All that stuff. So I, I think like that's that's again, it's all about like what's the unique commentary we're bringing to stuff. Yeah. Um. So I that's that's really the big thing for the year is expanding. Like we're trying to get more editors on. So it's a lot of like, okay, we're experiencing some growth. We could use a little more help. Yeah. But we also want to make sure that we have at least one higher concept idea that we can work on in the background. So we just don't spend the whole year just reacting to stuff because I like doing it. But also at a certain point starts to feel a little bit like it's just kind of all the same and it all starts to blend together. So I, we would definitely want to have like at least that one thing that we're doing in the background that's like different. There's two things that it really stood out to me that that I wanted to kind of summarize, I guess, at the end. And that is I like what you guys are doing where you're building a community around a particular subject where you make people feel welcome and a part of it. Right. And at the same time, you guys are enjoying it. 
you're getting um, appreciated for the work that you put in. And we talked about briefly, briefly about how the movie industry has kind of changed because it's it's starting to spoil everything, right? Like the drama is being brought in. Mm -hmm. But what you guys are trying to build or trying to bring into your growing channels is the the part of the movie pro making process that's really interesting without really spoiling anything. So it's almost like we want to show you guys what it's like to be working in a movie, like well, how mm. movies are being made. I like how you put it that way, how movies are being made, because that doesn't spoil anything, but it makes the process a little bit more interesting. To Like, I am now starting to understand a little bit more about the process and why things are the way they are and why so many decisions have to be made. And it was great to have you on. And if you are still open, I'd be, I'd love to have you back on the podcast and we can talk more about these, all these other stuff, especially we briefly only just talked about your channel because yeah. it's like, like I want to talk about what Adam does and all the things that are tied into that. You mean how I sit here and decide, do I want our videos to be in 16 by nine or yes. two to one? What looks exactly. better on mobile? <laughs> Exactly. Those are literally the things that go through my head. I'm like, how does this going to look on mobile? <laughs> so it's one of those things I definitely want to talk to Adam about some more in depth um, in a future episode. But um, I would love to, man. This was so much fun. And like, I, I love talking, you know, I love talking about the YouTube stuff that we do. But it's always so fun when people ask me, like, how did you get into it? Or, you know, just any of the stuff that we got into today of like, just kind of getting into the weeds of the production stuff. Because I think a lot of people sometimes think that people who make content on YouTube sometimes are all somewhat the same. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, I'm one of those people, I'm always researching what cameras did they use? Why did they choose this camera? What lenses are they using? Like, I'm really into that stuff. It, it interests me. And I, I don't learn it because I want to nitpick it. I learn it because I'm fascinated by yes. it. Like, I love... I have like an obsession with cameras and lenses and I'm like, Oh man, why, how did they get that? How did they get the bokeh to be, you know, what, what, what kind of anamorphic lens are they using? Who made it? How much does it cost? Can I afford it? Probably not. You know, what's it's, funny, Adam, I love doing that. you are the only person that I know that I follow at least who I know isn't a, a, who is, who don't call themselves a photographer or videographer, but yeah. gets so nerd, nerd, just you get so nerdy about, about cameras and gear. And I'm like, really technical about his stuff. Oh my God. <laughs> Maybe sometimes to a fault because I was literally just talking to Augustine and I was like, hey man, I think I might uh, route your computer through uh, NDI, through the network, da da da. Because we use vMix and you have to like call in and uh -huh. it uses a bandwidth on the internet. And I'm like, if I just put you on the network, I don't even have to, you don't even have to call in. I can just wire your computer, to, your camera to my computer. And I'm like, I'm getting like so technical about this and we're making reaction videos on YouTube. <laughs> but like that's to the level that I sometimes have to think of like, how do I get three people into a call where I can have separate audio channels, separate video channels, and then we can react to stuff and you can't hear it and da da da. You have to like literally sit down and technically figure out how to do all that. Right. And it gets really exhausting sometimes, <laughs> but you have to do it. Hope, hope you enjoyed this. And uh, yeah, that was well, great. Yeah. I had a great time. Thank you. Oh, before we end, before we end, uh, can you share uh, where they can find you? I know you have a couple of social media channels out there. So right. yeah, feel free to share them. Uh, my personal social media, I made it super easy. It's just my name, at Adam Hlavik. It's Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Facebook. Some of those I don't use as much as I should. <laughs> and then Heroes Reforged, you can literally just type it into Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, it's all Heroes Reforged. Again, I try to make it as as friction free as possible for everybody. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's that's where you can find us. We're doing videos every single week. And uh, what are we doing right now? We're in the process of doing the Book of Boba Fett reactions, and then we're going to be doing stuff all year. So just check that out. And uh, yeah, this was super fun. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. See, see you again next time. And again, for those of you who just discovered this podcast, thank you so much for listening. Uh, please support the show uh, by sharing it with your friends. That's pretty much. The only thing that I could ask, but I hope you enjoy it and um, I'll see you guys again next time.